Hello, and thank you for joining us on the Lessons of Vietnam show, where we attempt to tell the real story of the Vietnam War and those involved. We are privileged to broadcast from the studios of Nissan Communications. I am Bill Dixon, your host, Vietnam veteran 6768. I serve with the headquarters head this company, 159 Engineer Group, located at Long Bend Base uh, near Benoit and 20 miles north of Saigon. Tonight, we're going to talk about Vietnam and the nuclear option. Did we get to the point in the war? Who discussed it? What kept us from using it? Now, what I'd like for you to do, what I'd like for you to do is look at the numbers that uh, we're going to go back to real quick and get Amnon to, he didn't listen to me. He's like my wife now. Uh, the number's there. If call in to 919-518-9773 or even better, go on to Skype, Computers 2K Voice. Uh, make any comments, uh, questions, suggestions, uh, anything you know about the show. I greatly appreciate it. Help me out. Uh, if I'm not doing it like uh, something that I say that you have questions about, let me know because I want to make sure I get the real word out there. But uh, call in uh, or either come on Skype and let us know about the show, what you think, and so forth. Now we're going into, if you're out there and you're a veteran, and this time of year, it can be tough on us. Uh, call one of these numbers and get some help. There's somebody there waiting for you to call them. It's so important to, to reach out and to another veteran and so forth. I know because I, I go to a veterans group, and I know how much they help me every year. But uh, uh, we got to stop these uh, veteran suicides out there, especially a lot of us Vietnam vets who are getting, some of y'all are getting a little older each year. and. Uh, uh, before you were busy working and didn't have time to think about uh, the past, but now you're getting a little slower and taking more time, and those thoughts are coming back. So uh, call the people on that number. Now let's get into the show and um, talk about it. the Vietnam War and the nuclear option. Uh, okay, That's what we're going to be talking about. But in order to get to that point, we're going to talk about a little bit about the, about the uh, Cold War. Vietnam was part of the Cold War, and uh, Korea was part of the Cold War. And it says here that the uh, Cold War is a battle of ideologies and, and changing the balance of power. The Cold War was primarily between the United States and the, and the Union of Soviet Republic, uh, uh, Russia and, and all its allies and so forth. Uh, China was, was kind of goes in with uh, Russia and so forth. In 1945 to 1991, the Cold War dominated international affairs with global competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. We had a lot of one-upmanship during that time. At times, the, con uh, the constant arms race burst into an armed conflict, but overshadowing all was the threat of nuclear war. Let's talk about the timeline a little bit of the Cold War, I think, so you can understand the thinking during the Vietnam War. February 4th through 11th, 1945, the Yalta Conference. It was a meeting between uh, Churchill of Great Britain, Roosevelt of the United States, and Stalin from Russia. And they decided just what was going to happen to the world after the end of World War II. That must be quite of an uh, ego thing for those three men to get together and decide this is what's going to happen in the world uh, when we're ready for it. On May 8th, 1945, VE Day. Victory in Europe as Germans surrenders to the Russian army. July 17th to August 7th, 2nd in 1945, the Potsdam Conference. The Potsdam Conference formally divided Germany and Austria into four, into four, uh, into four parts. The German capital, Berlin, would be divided into four zones. The Russian-Polish border was decided, and Korea was to be divided into Soviet and American zones. I didn't realize that uh, was divided that way, but uh, until I did my research. But um, in August 6, 1945, Hiroshima, the United States dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima in Japan. That was the first use. On August 8, 1945, in Nagasaki, another um, uh, big town in Japan, uh, the United States dropped the second atomic bomb on Nagasaki. August 14, 1945, was considered VJ Day, the victory in Japan. The Japanese surrendered, bringing World War II to an end. Now, long about that same time, kind of got things going askew in, in Vietnam. 
In September 2nd, 1945, uh, Vietnam independence, Ho Chi Minh proclaimed Vietnam as an independent republic. See, when the Chinese who had, were in charge of Vietnam at the time of World War II, they were supposed to surrender to the French. But for some reason or another, they uh, surrendered to Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh. So that's how, kind of how Ho Chi Minh and Viet Minh got into uh, power right there is because instead of surrendering uh, as it was supposed to be, they surrendered to, uh, to Ho Chi Minh. On March 12, 1947, Truman Doctrine, where President Truman promised to help any country facing a communist takeover. So he, was, he said, basically, uh, we're going to stop communism from growing and we'll go out and do whatever we have to do to help any country whose threat of being overrun by communism. Okay. In June 1948, the formation of West Germany, the French, USA, United Kingdom, Kingdom uh, partitions of Germany were merged to form West Germany. In other words, all the, the, Germany was divided into four parts. Uh, the French, United States, United Kingdom took their three parts and put it together as uh, to form West Germany, which created new challenges. Okay. June 24, 1948, Berlin blockade. The Russians came in basically and said that our side of Russia, our side of Berlin is communist and you can't do anything about it. And they cut everything off. Uh, which created a problem. Russia's response to the merger of the French, USA, and United Kingdom partitions of Berlin was to cut all roads and rail links to that sector. This meant those living in West Berlin had no access to food, supplies, and faced starvation. Food was brought by Western Berliners by U.S. and United Kingdom airplanes, an exercise known as the Berlin Airlift. And these planes had to come in uh, over the sector and almost, uh, it was almost land like helicopters. Uh, to come in, and a lot of them crashed, or and so forth. May 1949, the end of the Berlin blockade. Russia ended the blockade of Berlin. Now, on April 4th, 1949, NATO was formed. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization formed Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, United Kingdom, United States came together in NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. August 29th, 1949, first lightning. The Soviets successfully their first nuclear device. Now, we have a nuclear device. Now the Soviets have a nuclear device. And shortly after that, the Red Chinese will have nuclear devices. Okay. In June 25th, 1950, the Korean War. The Korean War began with North Korea invaded South Korea. North Korea was a communist. South uh, was the United States and the uh, democratic uh, uh, country of uh, South Korea. July 27, 1953, the Korean War. The Korean War ended. North Korea remained affiliated with Russia while South Korea was affiliated with the USA. There was never a peace treaty signed. They just both side decided to lay down their weapons and go home. So that's why today we have a North Korea and a South Korea. North Korea being communist still and South Korea being an ally of the United States and, and uh, Democratic. On 1954, the Geneva Accords, this set of documents ended the French war with the Viet Minh and divided Vietnam into North and South of the states. The French had taken over uh, of Vietnam in, uh, after World War II, and, were, and even though um, Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh were there, but the French was I supposed to run the whole place, and uh, even then Ho Chi Minh and Viet Minh were more like uh, guerrilla fighters. The communist leader of North Vietnam was Ho Chi Minh, while the U.S. friendly South was led by uh, Diem. Okay? But also now, back during this um, war between uh, United States and Russia, the Cold War. November 1st, 1957, the space race. USR Sputnik II carried Lak Lakia, the, the dog, the first living creature into the space. Boy, did that make the Americans mad. On April 12th, 1961, the space race, race 
Russian cosmonaut Yuri. Okay, whatever. I can't remember his name. So, Akasevich uh, Gargan uh, became the first human in space. So here they sent a dog up first. Now they sent a human up first, and we don't like being second. So part of the uh, uh, the Cold War was the Korean War and the space race. On April 17th, 1961, now we're still in the middle of all this uh, uh, Cold War and our space race and so forth, but uh, April 17th, 1961, Bay of Pigs invasion, a force of Cuban exiles trained by the CIA, aided by the U.S. government, attempted to invade Cuba and overthrow the communist government of Fidel Castro. The attempt, the attempt fell due to the withdrawal of American support during the attack. When Kennedy came into power, he had a strong distrust for the Pentagon. So he brought in um, Robert McNamara and his smart guys to run things, and the Pentagon didn't like it a whole lot. So it's rumored that uh, even though United States backed uh, the Bay of Pigs invasion that the uh, Pentagon withdrew air support uh, because they were mad with uh, Kennedy and made Kennedy look bad. And he even got even worse about uh, taking care of uh, the Pentagon, which later kind of goes over into the how the war was fought because Kennedy started running things. And then when uh, Johnson came in, he started running things through the uh, White House rather than through the Pentagon. And, of course, Nixon did some of the same. So uh, August 13th, 1961, the Berlin Wall, the Soviet Union put up the Berlin Wall sitting off borders between East and West Germany. Uh, in other words, the people of West Germany couldn't go see friends and relatives in East Germany and vice versa. And there was a lot of people trying to escape from uh, uh Germany into the into the American or the free side was well, the other side was of course communist. On October fourteenth, nineteen sixty two, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis. As a result of a U.S. spy plane sighting the construction of a Soviet nuclear missile in Cuba, President Kennedy set up a naval blockade and demanded the removal of the missiles. War was averted when the Russians agreed on October twenty eighth to remove these weapons. Uh, we just all knew. Because I was a kid then, and we just, but we just all knew that uh, we were getting ready to have a nuclear war with Russia, uh, because Cuba was was 90 miles or so off our coast, and here the Russians were putting nuclear weapons that close. And Kennedy stood up and said no, and Khrushchev actually backed down, which we were all very happy when he did that instead of carrying on. Okay? Now. When I was growing up in the 60s and so forth, we were all worried about uh, the nuclear attacks. You can see the kids up there in the left-hand corner. We were taught to how to hide as a family uh, under tables and so forth. Like tables were going to really do a whole lot of good. Uh, we had, you probably see these signs today, the fallout shelters were there, uh, where you're supposed to go in case of a nuclear attack. There's the kids in school under the beds, I mean, under the tables. And then there's the families, a lot of families built their own personal fallout shelters. In fact, I have an uncle, uh, before he passed away, he still has, there's a fallout shelter in his backyard that he built for his family. Uh, that was our thinking then. We had, uh, we had, thought, uh, we had fire alarms, but we also had uh, nuclear attack alarms here during that period of time. Cause that was, I mean, just the nuclear war threat was always on our mind. I mean, just. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's what we thought about was uh, nuclear uh, attacks and so forth. And we still have the fallout shelters now for storms and so forth. But um, okay. <clears throat> On July 23rd, 1962, there was a situation in Laos. 14 nations, including China, South Vietnam, the Soviet Union, North Vietnam, and the United States signed an agreement promised to respect the neutrality of Laos which was somewhat of a joke during the war because the South Viet the North Vietnamese was using it as an infiltration. There was actually a war going on with the United States was involved in Laos, but you're not supposed to know about it because it was secret. We're going to do a show about that. Uh, but they were, they were neut neutral. Uh, in fact, if you were uh, one of our pilots got shot down uh, over Laos or close to Laos and, cr and crashed in Laos, 
he was only they were only allowed 24 hours or less to go in and find that uh, uh, pilot, or they couldn't go back and, and search for him anymore because of the neutrality. November 22nd, 1963, JFK assassination. President John Fitzgerald Kennedy was assassinated while on a visit to Dallas. And shortly after that, the U.S. allowed South Vietnam's President Diem to be assassinated. And there was a lot of question about just what the United States had to do with that. And just like the Kennedy assassination, there's a lot of questions out there still. There's a lot of conspiracy theories out there. I don't think we'll ever come into a total agreement uh, about Kennedy or uh, Dems being shot. On 8th of March, 1965, South Vietnam, 3,500 U.S. Marines were dispatched to South Vietnam. They landed at Red Beach. This marked the beginning of the American ground war. U.S. public opinion overwhelmingly supported the deployment. The first deployment of 35 in March 1965 was increased to nearly 200,000 by December. I mean, after we got them, after we got started, we just kept sending them and sending them and sending them. Uh, 200,000 from 3,500. Uh, let's see, March, April, May, June, July. Uh, that's not a whole lot of time to build facilities and uh, first aid and food and all that sort of for. But uh, we grew by up to 200,000. April 30th, 1970. Uh, the Vietnam War, uh, President Richard Nixon ordered U.S. troops to go to Cambodia. That was when he started expanding the war. Uh, there had been a secret war going on between the United States and Cambodian uh, communists for some time. Uh, that was another secret war that we were fighting in Cambodia. But this particular excursion was against the North Vietnamese communists, were uh, kind of separate from the war we already had going on with the troops over there. On August 15, 1973, Vietnam, the Paris Picas Accords ended American active combat involvement in Vietnam. So the Americans had officially, officially pulled out. On April 17, 1975, we had the Killing Fields of Cambodia. That's a really good movie out there about the Killing Fields. If you get a chance to see it, it says the name of the movie is Killing Fields. is a book and uh, uh, by a, a reporter from New York and the Cambodian uh, I think he recently died, re just recently here. The Khmer Rouge attacked and took control of Cambodia. Any supporters of the former regime, anyone with links or supposed links to foreign governments, as well as many intellectuals and professionals were executed in a genocide began known as the Killing Fields. And in other words, uh, the communists took over, and as they always do, anybody with education or question anything, they, got, they get rid of. Now, uh, April 30th, 1975, North Vietnam communists captured the South Vietnam capital, Saigon, bringing an official, an official end to the war, uh, leading the whole country to become communist. Now, I'm going to be using the word official uh, several times. That means it's officially ended, but not necessarily in real life ended in that particular day. But um, okay. on July 1975, Apollo, so yeah, test project. Joint space adventure between USA and USSR hurled as an end to space race. We joined hands and went in space race together. November 9, 1985, the fall of the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall was torn down, which means the people of, of West and, and, and East Berlin could uh, mingle it with each other, even though they were uh, communists on one side. 26 of December, which sounds very familiar here, uh, 1991 was the end of the Soviet Union. Russia formally recognized the end of the Soviet Union. In other words, the countries that all the countries that made up the Soviet Union, along with Russia, uh, all separated, and good most of them ended up being democratic. So uh, there was no more war as far as the space race uh, and the nuclear race as much, uh, supposedly. But then you start thinking about it. Uh, before, the Russians had control of who had their fingers on the uh, nuclear weapons. And after they broke up, uh, we're not quite certain who had their fingers on the nuclear weapon but buttons. So I'm not certain exactly. Uh, it was a good thing, but we've been all right so far. Uh, Brezhnev and Yeltsin declare a formal end to Cold War. So the Russians decided it was the end of the Cold War. So. Now, one of the things that was going on, and one of the things that probably kept us going here, 
was a mutual assured destruction. If you kill us, we'll kill you. This is from an article by Robert Wilde. Mutually assessed destruction, MAD, that's a good, good anonym for it, is a military theory of nuclear deterrence. Neither side will attack the other with their nuclear weapons because both sides are guaranteed to be totally destroyed in the conflict. No one will go all out nuclear war because no side can win and no side can survive. And we still have a little bit of that today with NORAD and, and such things. And uh, if they launch the missiles, we look at the launching missiles back at them to, uh, if they're going to kill us, we, our missile, by the time we're dead, then our missiles are going to hit them and they're all dead or vice versa. Um, which kind of goes back to the way the feeling was in the 60s and 70s back in the country as you're growing up. Uh, uh, what's going to happen this one day or the next? To many, mutual assured destruction helped or prevent the Cold War from turning hot. To others, it is the most ludicrous theory humanity ever put into a full-scale practice. It may be ludicrous, but at the same time, I, I, it, I, it served its purpose. Uh, it definitely kept, uh, uh, and you know a little bit more as we go into uh, Vietnam and the nuclear options there. Okay. Question. Could Vietnam have been a proxy war between the United States uh, and Russia during the Cold War? What is a proxy war? Well, a proxy war during the Cold War is the past proxy wars have been fought through the use of third parties in order to prevent a full-scale war. During the Cold War, the need to prevent such full-scale war became extremely important due to the fear of mutual assured destruction. Was Korea a proxy war? Well, the United States and Russia fighting each other, but using Korea rather than Russia or the United States? Uh, to fight that war. Uh, Vietnam was the same way. There was a lot of weapons and a lot of uh, uh, different aspects of war that were uh, improved and invented and so forth during both wars. Uh, the way we fought the war, the helicopter coming into being, there was so much things that uh, the weapons used that they used, uh, were invented or or uh, made better during the two wars. So uh, it's up to you. You can call it a proxy war. I personally think that it was, uh, to a pretty good extent, it was a proxy war because uh, it's a whole lot better to fight another country than it is to fight in your own country, especially if you uh, start thinking about nuclear weapons and so forth. And your people don't die, so they don't uh, get as mad. Okay. Now let's talk about, uh, there's, I couldn't figure out, I kept hearing the word technical nuclear weapons. And, uh, um, yeah, I'll get strategic nuclear weapons. What's the difference? Well, tactical nuclear weapons, uh, the launch, these weapons can be launched by aircraft, missiles, and artillery guns. So the target, tactical nuclear weapons are meant to destroy strategic military deployments. The damage, depending on the yield, the damage could be limited to one area, avoiding reducing civilian casualties. That's what the discussion was during the Vietnam War and before the Vietnam War, actually, was not the total destruction as Nagasaki and Hiroshima, but more of a uh, the technical nuclear weapons where we hit one particular spot. Uh, kind of like Agent Orange, though. Um, nobody ever talk, seems to be talking about the, the nuclear fallout and so forth from these things, but... Uh, they got them down to the point that they could hit one particular target and kind of maintain it to that particular thing, okay? Tactical versus strategic nuclear weapons. Tactical. U.S. and Russia's definition says it's less than 500 kilometers range, short range. Strategic, intended to detonate in other countries, i.e. intercontinental delivery. That's why we built missile silos at Nevada and other places so we had nuclear weapons heads on these missiles and we could shoot them from here and hit Russia and vice versa would be more strategic where they just kind of go in and blow everything up where the strategic was that um, we just do one area, okay? Now, doing all my research, the official line in Washington was that the nuclear option was never considered during the Vietnam War. And as we go in along in our show, I want you to give your own opinion on this. Uh, Okay. Uh, let's talk about Dien Bien Phu. That Dien Bien Phu of March 1954, the French military is surrounded by a siege at Dien Bien Phu, which was a location, uh, had a city there by the communist Viet Minh. 
Now, officially, the United States was not involved uh, at Dien Bien Phu or the war or with the French and the South Vietnam and the Vietnamese communists. However, we were financing about 70% of the war uh, for them, even though we didn't have that many troops. Uh, we had some advisors again. We, we like to send advisors uh, to different places. Dien Bien Phu was the last ditch effort to stop communist expansion by the French. They'd been fighting for a long time. And they just, they didn't want to go. They had to, this was kind of their last stand. And uh, so they, uh, rather than surrender for a long time, they stayed there. But finally, they surrendered at Dien Bien Phu. France asked uh, the United States for additional help and ended the siege. They were surrounded. They couldn't get food and weapons in, kind of like uh, our case on. So they asked for some help. The help back that time was uh, Eisenhower, Dwight uh, David Eisenhower was the president, and they come up with Operation Vulture, a secret plan to deploy three Mark VII. Which one is that? Is that seven? Seven. Uh, atomic bombs to be used on uh, the Viet Minh, which was we later knew as the Viet Cong, surrounded Dien Bien Phu. In other words, we were going to drop a series of atomic bombs, small atomic bombs on the uh, communists in different areas. I think it was three or four different areas uh, around uh, Dien Bien Phu. Uh, then President Eisenhower considered giving France a few atomic weapons, even though it was uh, illegal to do so at the time. He did talk to him about it. Uh, he offered, but French never came up with a yes or no, give it to me or don't give it to me. And before they had a, a thing, anything to be done, uh, neither plan was carried out, though. The French troops surrendered at Dien Bien Phu and shortly thereafter left Vietnam. We almost, we almost came close to doing it then. Now, the RAND Corporation, some of you may have heard of them. They're a policy think tank. RAND Corporation is an American nonprofit global policy think tank created in 1948 by Douglas Aircraft Company to offer research and analysis to the United States Armed Forces. It is financed by the United States government and private endowments, corporations, universities, and private individuals. The company has grown to assist other governments, uh, international organizations, and private companies and foundations with hosts of defense and non-defense issues, including health care. RAND aims for, uh, aims for interdisciplinary and quantitative problem solving by translating theoretical concepts from formal economics and physical sciences into novel applications in other areas using applied science and operation research. That's a mouthful. Uh, that's the, the smart people we're supposed to get together and study about different ways and prop, how to solve our problems, uh, whatever they may be. In 1975, 1957, a RAND war game scenario called uh, Vietnam III had North Vietnam invading South Vietnam across the DMZ in Laos. Within 26 war game days, the North Vietnamese forces were repelled with the use of 34 tactical nuclear weapons. Now, remember, these are ones we drop, small ones we drop in different places. The Kennedy administration wasn't quite certain they liked that uh, report, so they come up with their own. And But even that, then they used the RAND Corporation to do it. Uh, this time, 310,000 North Vietnamese and Laotian troops invaded both South Vietnam and Thailand. With a 30-day war game day, the war ended with the communist defeat and 45% casualties. 208 tactical nuclear weapons were used to destroy passes along the Laotian and Vietnamese border, forest and enemy, army, and enemy armies. But, however... The game ended with the North Vietnamese comments still with a force in the field and undefeated. Okay, so what did we gain? A lot of, play, a lot of uh, nuclear fallout. Uh, neither scenario seemed to address environmental damages. They never, never seemed to, uh, any of these uh, tests they did, reports, they ever thought about uh, what they were going to do afterwards. It's kind of like our Agent Orange problems we're having now, but this would have been worse. What, what was the effect going to be on the troops? What was the effect going to be on the economy and uh, basically the land and so forth in those areas? Part of the concern to officially intervene in Vietnam was what would the Chinese do? Now, when we were getting ready to go into to Vietnam, uh, it was always that question. Vietnam, 
was right now it, it, it uh, butts up to China just like Korea did. Now, one of the reasons that China got into the Korean War was because uh, uh, the United States went over into China and was attacking uh, Chinese and the uh, Koreans in, into into China, and that's what brought them down. Um, the generals there kind of screwed that one up. The Joint Chiefs of Staff in a memo in 1964 stated the use of tactical nuclear weapons would be military useful and have a greater probability of stopping a Chinese intervention. This is Joint Chiefs of Staff. These are the heads of the different militaries, the Army, Navy, Marines, uh, and so forth, Air Force, and so forth. In 1964 and 65, political leaders did not necessarily go as far as the Joint Chiefs, but during their discussion over whether to intervene in Vietnam, they raised the issue of nuclear weapons and seemed prepared to accept the possibility that they may be needed and that they needed to be prepared to do it. Okay. Now, during the Laotian crisis we talked about a while ago, uh, Kennedy uh, was kind of uh, pressured by the Joint Chiefs of Staff and his staff to intervene. Uh, in the uh, communist crisis down in Laos. The uh, decision was uh, to not intervene was contrary to his staff and thoughts, and, and Eisenhower, of course, suggested the use of nuclear weapons, being the past president. In 1964-65, as the Johnson administration was considering intervening in Vietnam, under Secretary of State George Ball was allowed the sending force to get, not to get involved. That's Mr. Ball there. Uh, he foresaw the consequences that as the ground fighting continued and continued, the United forces would be taking a substantial number of casualties and there would be a lot of pressure for the use of nuclear weapons. In other words, if we go into war with Vietnam or whatever, and as the, as the body count starts going up, the American people are going to want to do something about it. And what are they going to want to do? It could very well be uh, a nuclear war. Ball's argument had several points. The use of another nuclear weapon on Asians would, would result in a large political cost. Racist. The bombing of Asians, again, would appear as racial biases towards Asians after the original use of the bombs on Japan. And we dropped the bomb on Japan, the Asians, and now we're talking about dropping the bomb again on Asians. The use of nuclear weapons would make Russia look better. Russia had never used a nuclear weapon. They had them, but they never used it. The use by the U.S. would cause a political problem in some countries. Remember, the Cold War was still going on. Well, who, wanted to look, who looked bad this day and who looked bad tomorrow? The use of uh, nuclear weapons would revise a sense of guilt within the American people. The United States dropping a bomb on civilians of uh, Japan uh, ended the war and probably saved more lives than it will cost, but there was still a uh, feeling in it by the people in the United States was. Well, you know, we killed a lot of civilians and just a lot of guilt there to, to, with a lot of people. It might bring Russia and China into the war, an escalation that could begin a complete nuclear war. Remember the uh, MAD, uh, mass uh, uh, mutual in, uh, destruction? Uh, so that was what he was talking about. When we started, when uh, Johnson uh, got us started into, uh, into Vietnam, he started Operation Rolling Thunder. Uh, you may have heard of Rolling Thunder today as a motorcycle organization that uh, uh, was an organization. Most people are riding motorcycles, uh, did a lot of good work uh, in the community. Uh, but that's where they got their name from, Operation Rolling Thunder. And began in the spring of 1965, Chinese leaders signaled through back channels they do not become involved as long as the United States refrained from invading North Vietnam. China or bomb the Red River dikes. Now, they come out and said, hey, you don't go into North Vietnam, invade them. You can fight all you want to in South Vietnam. We'll stay out. If you bomb us, we won't stay out. And if the Red River dikes, uh, the Red River dikes, if they was felt if they were bombed, the over a million people would, would drown in the aftermath. However, China stated if war came, even nuclear weapons would not make them quit, and the war would have no boundaries. So they said, we won't bother you, but if we do, uh, it's going to be bad. 
President Lyndon Johnson did not want to be the president who set the precedent for use of a nuclear weapon. To him, it was completely unthinkable. He had his great society going, and he didn't want to be the guy that was remembered his legacy. Everybody that becomes president, I think, worried about their legacy. What are they going? What are they going to think about me when I'm gone? Johnson was determined to keep the war restrained. This was the way that Robert McNamara and other cabinet members thought as well. We aren't going to do anything to uh, have nuclear weapons. However, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara opposed the use of nuclear weapons. He felt they were morally wrong and lacked reason. McNamara ordered a study of the U.S. stockpile of nuclear weapons. As a result of the study, he reduced the megatonnage stockpile by 50% and increased the capacity of conventional weapons. But McNamara was not against using the threat of nuclear intervention as a bluff. In other words, it's like playing poker. You're going to bluff the guy to get him to fold or whatever. Well, McNamara had no problem of, of, of promising to drop the nuclear weapons uh, on North Vietnam or whatever to uh, get their attention. In April 1965, just after the deployment of combat troops to Vietnam, an interview with a New York Times reporter, McNamara made the following comments. Quote, We are not following a strategy that recognizes any sanctuary or weapons restriction. Basically, what that says, we can go anywhere we want to, and we'll use whatever we want to. But we'll use nuclear weapons only after a fully applying non-nuclear arsenal. In other words, if 100 planes couldn't hit, take out a target, we wouldn't necessarily go to nuclear weapons. We would go try 200 planes and so on. But it never said just how many planes it would take before they would go back in and, and do that. But inhibitions on using nuclear weapons are not overwhelming. Conceded it would be a gigantic step. We would use whatever weapons we felt necessary to achieve our objective, recognizing that one must offset against the price. That's kind of saying we could be maybe if we could, maybe. In other words, kind of uh, political talk. So you don't know which way. When the article came out, it stirred quite a controversy. McNamara amended his comments the day after. There is no military, this is the quote, there is no military requirements for nuclear weapons in the present and foreseeable future. And what he's saying there is uh, there's no requirements right now but uh, or coming up, but it's still that contingency out there. There's no useful purpose that can be served by speculating on remote contingencies. Now, the Soviet Union was listening to all this. Uh, Soviet Union leaders got the word that U.S. officials were entertaining nuclear options. They viewed this with great alarm, mutual destruction. In one of their regular reports, it was reported that the use of tactical nuclear weapons in Vietnam was on the agenda of U.S. policymakers. Policymakers, okay? During the Cold War. The Jasons. This is another think tank. This think tank was using uh, the uh, younger uh, younger people. The JASE is an independent group of elite scientists which advise the United States government on matters of science and technology, mostly of a sensuous nature. The group was first created as a way to get a younger generation of scientists in advising the government. Now, how they got about doing this report is kind of strange. It was established in 1960 and was somewhere between 30 and 60 members. They usually met in the summer. Although most of its research is military focused, Jason's also produced early work on the science of global warming and acid rain. And that's a book about them by Ann uh, Frank uh, Biner. The Vietnam War had a significant effect on the Jason's membership and research focus. By around 1966, the team had become strongly divided over along political and ethical lines. In March 1967, working off a rumor that the administration was considering nuclear weapons, a group of Jasons produced a report titled Tactical Nuclear Weapons in Southeast Asia. Okay, just the, nobody, nobody from the administration had approached them and said, okay, I want you to do a report. They heard the rumor that they were talking about it, so they put together this report, as you can see there. The paper predicted catastrophic 
consequences for U.S. global interests as well as for the people and the environment of Southeast Asia. Going into great detail, the paper strongly contradicted game scenario research from RAND Corporation and other groups that were optimistic about a nuclear option. The report's main finding was that employment of nuclear weapons by the U.S. will be of little use against a widely distributed opponent, but disaster if copied by the, by the opponent. Okay, I'm, and I'll explain that to you in just a moment. And if, in a nuclear counterstrike against U.S. troops, the reporter concluded that in the worst-case scenario, the U.S. fighting capacity capability in Vietnam would be essentially annihilated. The Viet Cong communists were spread all across the country. The United States had bases all over South Vietnam. Had we, the report says if we drop nuclear uh, uh, weapons on to the communists or in North Vietnam, it'd be a whole lot easier for them to come back around and do much more damage by dropping a nuclear uh, weapon on Americans who are uh, clustered in bases. Uh, it, would, it would kill a whole lot more Americans than it would be because they were in tunnels, they were scattered all over the place. This reason was based on the thought that American troops were primarily located in base camps and groups, whereas the communists were more scattered and it would take more weapons to affect them. Now let's talk about uh, Quezon. Quezon was up on the uh, DMZ right at the Laotian border. Uh, 6,000 Marines were surrounded and besieged by 15 to 20,000 communists for 77 days. Quite a stir when that was going on. In early 1968, the siege of the remote Marine combat base at Quezon dominated American news coverage of the war in Vietnam. Now, Johnson really got upset, and it's reported he said, we don't want no more down ben, Den Ben Foos, or he had his own way of pronouncing it. In other words, he didn't want to get his butt kicked and have to pull out because of uh, what the comments were doing in Den Ben Foo. It's kind of interesting, if you look at the pictures here, the one in black and white of the French at, at, uh, at uh, Den Ben Foo, and if you look at the color one, it's the Americans at uh, Quezon. Uh, it does have a lot of struck, uh, uh, similarities there. News accounts ominously compared the siege of Quezon to Dinh Ben Phu. The remote French garrison surrounded and forced to surrender to Vietnamese commerce in 1954. Johnson didn't want to be the first president to set the president of dropping the nuclear weapons, but he didn't want to be the first president to out and out lose a war. The Johnson administrator found itself in the position of could Quezon become another Den Men Fu? Should they use tactical nuclear weapons, or would sending more men to Quezon be adequate? The one, the one attempt by the Johnson administration to look more closely at the military utility of nuclear weapons to relieve the siege at the Marine garrison at Quezon in early 1968 was stopped quickly in a public relations nightmare. The rumor got out, those White House leaks, and the, and the public just had a fit and fell in it. This was perhaps the moment of gravest risk of the kind anticipated by the Jasons. Evans suggests that top administrating officials discuss the topic of, of several meetings throughout the key, tense key days of late January and early February 1968, albeit with a tone of greatest reluctance. Johnson made clear he had no wish to face the decision on use of nuclear weapons and repeatedly sought assurance from military leaders that had adequate conventional forces to vend Quezon. Uh, he was, he didn't want to make that, that decision. And I can't imagine someone making that decision to do something as, uh, uh awesome as that and the consequences would be. The general at that time was General Westmoreland. Uh, this was a time of Tet. Uh, declassified documents outlines a plan by General William Westmoreland to move nuclear weapons into Vietnam in 1968 in the event that they, were be need, they would be needed or in a quick response situation. Remember, Tet was going on, Quezon was going on. General Westmoreland had planned to have the nuclear weapons in the ready at the ready should the United States find themselves on the losing end of Battle of Quezon. In other words, if it looks like the commerce were going to hold out, we're going to nuke them with a series of tactical news. The secret operation was codenamed Fracture Jaw and was underway. Now, this is a copy of the secret message 
that Westmoreland sent to Admiral Sharp. Uh, I'm going to read it to you because it's kind of hard to read. Uh, reference, SINPAC, uh, whatever, uh, COM, SINPAC, plan, uh, fracture jaw has been approved by me. In other words, Westmoreland said, I have approved the plans. Uh, publication now in progress and plan will be dispatched by Armed Forces Courier Service on uh, 11th of February. And that's what he sent to uh, the, uh, General Sharp, who was in uh, Hawaii at the time, uh, that he had approved use of uh, nuclear weapons and the location, not the use, but the location of uh, nuclear weapons. On the same day, Westmoreland had informed Admiral Sharp that he had approved of Operation Fractured Jaw. White House National Security Advisor Walt Rostow informed the president of Westmoreland's plans. And here's the letter, here's a copy of the White House letter. With respect to your questions this morning about the nuclear matter, Mr. President, attached herein is the memorandum to General Wheeler from Bob Ginsburg. As you see, he raised the matter on his own with respect to Din Bin Fu and no relation to the White House or me. In Admiral Sharp's response to General Wheeler's back channel message, which followed, Admiral Sharp said that he and Westy had exchanged, Westy been Westmoreland, had uh, exchanged views several days previously on the need for some very closely held plan planning about nuclear weapons should the situation around Quezon warrant it and should be highest authority directed uh, their use. He noted it was unlikely the situation at Quezon would become so desperate to warrant such use, but felt that military prudence alone required such a planning. There are no nuclear weapons in South Vietnam. Presidential authority would be required uh, to put them there. That was the answer back from uh, the White House, or one of the answers, okay? Now, this is the letter that uh, was sent back to Admiral Sharp and, uh, and to Westy. When the president learned that the planning had already been set in motion, he became very upset and sent a very stern message through Rustow to Westmoreland. Uh, here is the uh, tail wagging the dog situation. Uh, if you go back to a couple of shows I did in the past, uh, Nick uh, Johnson did not order the bombing of North Vietnam uh, as a result of the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Uh, McNamara did without his knowledge, and I'm certain that he was still kind of uh, smarting on that. Uh, when he found out that Westmoreland and had and his guys had uh, kind of uh, decided on themselves to uh, bring in a nuclear thing, so he uh, he sent uh, to shut to Sharp uh, through Rostow and Westy to uh, shut it down, but and keep it quiet that they even thought about it, so that the people of the United States and so forth wouldn't get an upper hour grim. Johnson had pressured his generals to make sure there was no defeat at Quezon. He had not expected one of his generals to consider the nuclear route. He put a lot of pressure on him not to have another Din Ben Fu, but he didn't give him a, a whole lot of ways other than conventional ways. Quezon besieged troops were never informed of the action. Uh, they never knew what was going on so forth. Johnson began his speech in March 31st, 1968. Uh, he spoke to the nation. I remember the night. Uh, Johnson began his speech by characterizing it as an address about peace in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. Johnson states he has ordered a partial halt to the bombings of North Vietnam to demonstrate that the United States is prepared to move immediately towards peace through negotiations. At the same time, he states he has sent 11,000 additional troops to Vietnam within the last few weeks and is prepared to send another 18,500 within the next five months. He also discussed accelerating U.S. support to South Vietnamese military. Now, the peace talks, they had started doing the peace talks with uh, uh, North Vietnam at this time. But the kicker on this speech was President Lyndon Baines Johnson ended his talk to the nation with, I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party as your president. Later at a White House news conference, he said his decision was completely irrevocable. He was tired of the pressure. He was tired of the protesters. Uh, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids you killed today? And, and all the other stuff that was going out there. 
So he uh, said that he'd had all the pressure with the nuclear and so forth that he was going to do. Okay. Not long after nuclear isolation on the nuclear options, Johnson started a peace talk with the North Vietnamese communists. The first, first significant attempt at peace talks came in May of 1968 with an informal meeting between U.S. and North Vietnamese envoys in Paris. Each made demands on the other before any serious peace negotiations were to commence. Hanoi warned to halt to all U.S. bombings runs along their, uh, over their country, while the Americans insisted on a de-escalation of Viet Cong activities in South Vietnam. Five months later, Lyndon Johnson agreed to suspend all bombing sorties over North Vietnamese territory, paving the way for formal peace talks or negotiations. The Paris peace talks would last more than four years. They were plagued with setbacks and breakdowns from the onset or outset. The first meetings were marred by disputes over procedure, mainly because delegates from Hanoi and National Liberation Front uh, refused to negotiate, recognize the legitimacy of South Vietnamese government. There was even bickering over the types of furniture to be used. The North Vietnamese demanded the withdrawal of U.S. troops, the dissolution of South Vietnamese government, and return to the principle of the Geneva Accords. There was arguments for whether the table should be round, square, oval, or whatever. That was just some of the excuses they were using to uh, keep from getting together and actually coming up with something. U.S. insisted that Hanoi recognized the sovereignty of South Vietnam. The two sets of demands were so yeah, consolable that compromise or agreement seems impossible. By the autumn of 1969, the Paris talks had fallen to a monotonous and unproductive routine, wherein all restated their positions but refused to concede ground. Now, after uh, Johnson decided to uh, not run, uh, Nixon, who had run for uh, president before uh, Ke with, against Kennedy and lost, now he's going to run again. And his, his speech was, peace with honor. In 1968, the Paris peace talks intended to put an end to the 13-year uh, Vietnam War failed. They failed because an aide working for then-president candidate uh, candidate Richard Nixon convinced the South Vietnamese to walk away from the from any dealings because Nixon would give them a butter deal. He went behind Johnson's back and went straight to South Vietnam. Okay. Nixon's presidential campaign needed the war to continue since Nixon was running on a platform that opposed the war. Nixon feared a breakthrough at the Peace Paris Peace Talks designed to find a negotiated settlement to the Vietnam War, and he knew this would derail his campaign. He was afraid that Humphrey would get all the credit for it. In late teen, uh, who was his uh, opponent? In late October 1968, there were major concessions from Hanoi, which promised to allow meaningful tests to get in the way in Paris and side on the table. Concessions that would justify Johnson calling for a complete bombing halt of North Vietnam. This was exactly what Nixon feared. Nixon won by 1% of the popular vote. Once in office, he escalated the war into Laos and Cambodia. And here's a guy that uh, was supposed to be going to bring peace with honor, and he uh, added the war. With the loss of an additional 22,000 American lives before finally settling for his peace agreement in 1973 that was within grasp in 1968, five years later. There wasn't a whole lot of difference between the peace agreement in 1968 as it was in 1973 when he went in and said, don't do nothing because I'm going to take over. Uh, his, his running mate was Agnew, who had his own uh, personal problems and resigned uh, during the presidency also. In their initial efforts to end the Vietnam War, Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger attempted uh, to uh, lever concessions from Hanoi at the negotiating table with military force and coercive diplomacy. They were not seeking military victory, which they did not believe was feasible. In other words, they weren't trying to win the war. They were just trying to end the war and by threatening nuclear um, action. Instead, they backed up their diplomacy towards North Vietnam and the Soviet Union with the madman theory. And he, did, he pulled this off really good because everybody thought he was a madman of threatening excessive force, which included a specter of nuclear forces. They began with verbal threats, then bomb, then bombed North Vietnamese and Viet Cong bases areas in Cambodia, signaling that there were more to come. 
Nixon in both his 1964 and 1968 presidential uh, campaign has spoken out against the use of nuclear weapons in Vietnam. I am firmly opposed to the use of nuclear devices of any sort, not only because of the disastrous effect this would have on the world opinion, but because it is wholly unnecessary. Nixon's public of opposition during his campaign for the president to use nuclear weapons in the war was dictated by the requirements of his campaign. In other words, who he was talking to that particular day is how he made his speech. And I, I thought this button that uh, the Republicans had made uh, was very interesting. Uh, so I had to put that in there. Uh, 1968 elections. Uh, Republicans, Richard Nixon, law and order at home and secret plan for Vietnam. War must be ended. It must be ended honorably. Now, those of you who are familiar with the history of uh, Nixon, uh, the law and order at home, and uh, peace with honor, uh, we're probably laughing yourself right now, and uh, uh, it gets worse as we go, okay? In 1969, in a drunk, a drunk Richard Nixon ordered a nuclear strike on North Korea for shooting down a spy plane. Henry Kissinger intervened and made him sober up before deciding. The madman theory was not that far off when it came to dealing with. Uh, as we used to call him Tricky Dick. In a 1985 interview with Time Magazine, he stated he had considered using nuclear weapons on four occasions. One was to end the war in Vietnam. Even though reports initiated by Nixon himself showed that South Vietnam could not maintain without the support of the United States military, Nixon became his Vietnamization plan, where the South Vietnamese troops would gradually take over as the United States troops withdrew. In other words, as a report, he already knew when he became president that South Vietnam could not exist without our support. He started a Vietnamization because it sounded good and was able to pull the troops back a little bit at the time. Now, let's talk about a little bit about Henry Kissinger. <coughs> he was almost as much as a madman as, uh, as Tricky Dick. Henry Kissinger, National Security Advisor in 1969 and 1973. U.S. could not appear weak and retain global leadership. Shape Nixon's foreign policy. He also says the immigration of Jews from the Soviet Union is not an objective of American foreign policy. And if they put Jews into gas chambers in the Soviet Union, it's not American concern. Maybe a humanitarian concern. I thought he was a Jew. Okay. Uh, military men are dumb, stupid animals to be used as pawns for. Foreign policy, for foreign policy. This is the guy that is the security advisor. One of the first goals of the Nixon administration was to revise the U.S. nuclear strategy to provide for more limited options. The Vietnam War, the biggest foreign policy issue Nixon had to deal with uh, when he became president. President Nixon, the ultimate anti-communist hawk, dream of ending the Vietnam War with a knockout blow. On January 27, 1969, Nixon, Kissinger, General Wheeler, and Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird met to discuss military options which might ajar the North Vietnamese into being more forthcoming at the Paris talks. On February 21st, Laird forwarded to Kissinger a very preliminary Joint Chiefs of Staff report on the matter. The top secret report identified by five fairly aggressive scenarios. The last one involving what is referred to as a technical escalation. Use of atomic, biological, and lethal chemical weapons. In evaluating this option, the report noted that use of such weapons in Vietnam would excite a very strong public congressional reaction, adding that the predictable reaction worldwide, particularly in Japan and Okinawa, gave conclusive, conclusive factors against its employment. Kissinger, during the same period, was looking into the nuclear con counter contingencies in Vietnam, codenamed Operation. Code Duck, a plan for massive use of force against North Vietnam. Duck Hook suggested massive bombings of Hanoi, Haiphong, and other strategic areas in North Vietnam. The mining of harbors and rivers, bombing the Red River Dyke, remember the Chinese said, a ground invasion of North Vietnam, what the Chinese said, the use of weapons on the central and north south passes of Ho Chi Minh Trail, that would have been uh, strategic. Uh, uh, tactical nuclear weapons, as well as the bombing of the main railroad lines between North Vietnam and China. Kissinger presented the Operation Duck Hook plan to Nixon, 
who made no decision for or against the plan. Nick kept Operation Hook secret from his Secretaries of State and Defense. He just kind of kept it to himself for a while. In spring 1972, President Nixon was considered the escalation options that would go well beyond an all-out bombing of North Vietnam. This certainly was a reflection of Nixon's frustration with the war in Vietnam. It was clear by this time that nuclear weapons were not an option politically. Nixon made a statement during a cabinet meeting that South, Met, South Vietnam may lose, but the United States can't lose. A note from me. This is a man who uh, took our ally and going to go with peace with honor. We were going to have peace with honor, but we were going to throw South Vietnam to the wolves if that's what it took. Nixon clearly had no inhibitions personally about violating any democratic norms during his presidency when he felt he could get away with them. The Watergate Commission and, uh, and all the other stuff. Uh, the only restraint he seemed to have, have against the use of nuclear weapons was the concern of public opinion. He was afraid of what the public was going to do. We came dangerously close to nuclear wa uh, war during the Vietnam War. While no nuclear weapons were deployed in Vietnam, there were in the region on aircraft carriers and in stockpiles with increasing numbers up through 1967. Plans for major escalation of war included nuclear and non-nuclear options. Recently declassified documents confirmed the existence of these plans. These plans were first revealed in the Pentagon pa uh, papers that Daniel Esberg, uh, Ellisberg came out with, which is another show I'm working on. In 1965, the Joint Chiefs of Staff assured President Johnson that the war could be won. It would need between 500,000 to 1 million troops. The Joint Chiefs recommended the bombing right up to the Chinese border. They assumed that if the Chinese were to come into the war, the United States would cross the border into China and use nuclear weapons to completely demolish the communists. Former President Dwight Eisenhower recommended to Johnson to use nuclear weapons in North and South Vietnam. In 1964, the presidential candidate, Barry Goldwater, argued for the use of nuclear weapons. And then there was President Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger. The end result was that no administration used a nuclear option. They chose to fight with conventional weapons and possibly lose rather than win nuclear war. I hate to think of what it would have been, had we continued fighting and we had dropped and gone with a nuclear option, but uh, thank goodness we didn't. Uh, I'm not certain how, I still have a problem saying we lost the war because we weren't there. Uh, again, thank you for. Uh, but it, but, I've, I've got to say, okay. but it wouldn't have been much of a problem to bring tactical weapons there because we had them. Yeah, they were already, they were there uh, and Israel had them, didn't they? Look at this. Yeah. This is a recoilless, they call it Davy Crockett. It's an atomic bomb. Well, Launcher when, from a Jeep, just yeah. like mine. Well, when the, when the Marines landed at Red Beach in 1965, there, they had artillery there that was capable of firing yeah. uh, nuclear weapons. So it wasn't that far. Thank you for uh, tuning in uh, I, as, tonight. As, and I hope you uh, found it interesting. On the Lessons of, uh, Lesson of Vietnam show will be in January 9th, 2019. Can you believe that? Another year. This was the last show of the year. We will have uh, as uh, either a guest or going back to Vietnam to build a playground. One of those two shows, uh, whether we have a guest or not, it's going to depend on our guest uh, availability for the show. Uh, his, uh, our former host, Bob Matthews, has now moved to uh, uh, Pennsylvania, and he has got the Lessons of Vietnam curriculum working up there. So um, uh, he's going to be talking about what he's doing up there. Uh, please don't forget, you can watch any of our past shows or this show on demand by just going to the On Demand tab. From Amnon and I, we wish you a very happy new year and look forward to talking with you on January 9th, 2019. It'll be sometime in February before I can start writing 2018. I'll be writing 2018 uh, up until somebody finally gets across to me. It's 2019. Thank you for tuning in and happy new year. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network.
If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.